Okay, well, I believe that we're now live. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning. And uh, thank you for joining our mobilities and transport session. Uh, my name is Andrew Seedhouse, and I'm the Director of Transport um, within the Plymouth University. Now, we've got two excellent uh, presenters for you this morning, and I'm sure it'll be a, a thoroughly stimulating uh, session for everyone and set you up for the whole rest of the uh, the conference. Um, now, if you've got any questions to raise as we go through, please put them in the uh, comment section and then we'll do a, a Q&A at the end uh, with both of the speakers that we uh, have. And we'll try and get through as many of those as uh, possible. Right, let's pile straight in. So our first presentation this morning is from Nick Bowyer on decarbonizing our transport systems, challenges and opportunities. Now, Nick uh, is an associate director at ACOM and he specializes very much in transport planning, traffic modeling and economics, and in particular, the role and the impact of transportation uh, sector and climate change. So very much building on the, the theme that we've had at the introduction already this morning. Now, Nick's based in uh, Bristol with a big patch covering the whole of Southwest England uh, and indeed South Wales. And he's been with ACOM now for about 15 years. So we certainly uh, know his stuff in this area. So uh, I welcome Nick and I will hand over to yourself. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I guess just to provide a bit of context as to why I may have been asked here today. Um, I'm actually working as part of the Devon Climate Emergency to help develop the Devon Carbon Plan, um, which will set the earliest credible date for net zero emissions for the county. Um, and I'm part of the task force of whom there's many other speakers taking part in the Sustainable Earth Conference um, over the next two days. So it's, it's really great to be here. Um, so what, what I want to do is just take you through quite a high level introduction. We've only got 15 minutes into decarbonizing our transport systems, what the key problems are, some challenges that arise from that and the opportunities um, that, that it brings. Now, I would say you're not gonna be able to touch on much of these in detail, but hopefully this gives you some stimulating, some stimula stim stimulation even, and, and you know, hopefully puts you in good stead for the conference, gives you things to think about, and we can hopefully get a bit of conversation going. So first, why is it important that we decarbonize our transport systems? Now, I'm sure many of you are aware that um, transport is the dominant sector for greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. Um, and it, it's really quite surprising how transport has, has effectively taken over the role as the dominant sector from energy, which has made some great strides in the past uh, 20 years. Um, and transport has a real problem in terms of trying to mitigate its emissions and bring those down. So, so just in terms of the stats behind this, surface transport, which is basically everything that's not, not aviation or, or on the water, that accounts for 22% of all the UK's emissions. Here in Devon, that's even higher, it's around 30%, so it's a real problem. Um, aviation accounts for 70% of UK emissions, and that's a really tough one to deal with. Um, there's really no clear path at the moment into how we can get emissions down. Many of the technologies that we're seeing in terms of low carbon fuels are, are, are very much in their infancy and will take a long time to propagate through. Um, and, and I think really just to set the context here, a lot of the time when we ask people and ask people to think around what is the problem with transport? We get told, oh, it's dirty lorries, dirty vans making deliveries. Well, actually, it's, it's not. It's the movement of people um, accounts for two thirds of all our surface transport emissions. Um, and I think really to set that in context, only about 1% of that comes from our rail networks. Most of that comes from cars and people driving. Um, and I think really the other, the other point here that's just worth noting is that again, there's this perception out there that it's lots of commuters causing problems. Yes, that's true. They cause lots of congestion problems, but in terms of emissions and the amount of journeys that they're responsible for, they're only responsible for about one journey in six. So it's really a problem of general travel on the network. So why are we in the situation that we're in? Well, transport emissions have fallen really slowly um, since 1990. Um, especially when we start putting that into the context of other sectors. 
So as I mentioned earlier, energy was by far the most dominant um, sector in terms of emissions previously. That's seen a massive fall, um, 66% since 1990. Transport, uh, conversely, has only seen a 5% fall in, in all of its emissions output, and that's actually slowing down. Um, in terms of what this means and, and what's happening, um, what we can see is that total fuel used has remained broadly stable over this period. So we are seeing the impact of more efficient vehicles, more efficient engines, um, using less petrol and less diesel to move around the network. However, what we are seeing is that over that same period, people are traveling more and they're traveling further. So we're seeing that people have traveled by, people's travel distance has increased by 29%. That's because in real terms, the cost of travel by, by car has come down. Um, and what we're seeing is a trend, a consumer trend towards SUVs, compact crossover vehicles that are less efficient uh, and, and burn more fuel. Um, and there's a policy element here as well. That's been assisted by the abolition of graduated vehicle excise duty by the government. So that really sets in context why we are where we are. And just thinking through how we get to net zero, really, and broadly speaking, there's only two options. Either we travel less or we decarbonize the fleet. Um, now, ultimately, there's probably a combination of those, uh, those options that we need to talk through. Uh, and we need to get in place very quickly. And I'll, I'll take through that some of the challenges and opportunities that those bring on the next few slides. Um, but, but really, in terms of getting there and getting there quickly, decarbonizing the fleet is the way to go. 98% of our fleet currently uses petrol and diesel. Um, there's clearly, for, for car journeys, and they're the ones that are accounting for around two thirds of our, of our transport emissions, um, there's a clear path electrification has been taken over by the manufacturers it's being promoted by governments um, we're seeing with policies in terms of uh, internal combustion engine sales being banned from 2030 uh, plug-in hybrids from 2035 that there is actually a, a general push here and, and a real push to, to decarbonize the fleet through a transition to electric um, but and then why i've put it at the bottom of our our image here is that if we do that and we just move to electric and don't try and do anything else in terms of demand management, reducing traffic, shifting people to sustainable modes, I think we're really on for what we, what, we, what has been termed as a successful failure. Yes, we might hit our reductions in carbon targets, but what we will fail to do is to bring forward all the other co-benefits that could be, could be associated with a more efficient transport system. So that is co-benefits around getting people on out of the uh, cars into uh, more sustainable modes, whether that's public transport, whether it's walking and cycling, um, and all the health benefits that are associated with that. And, and as I'll mention on the next few slides for opportunities, real benefits that we can give local communities through relocalization of services. So, so reducing travel should be our top priority, um, but decarbonizing the fleet is really the quickest way to get there. So a few challenges before we move on to um, opportunities that the system affords us. So looking through challenges, I just want to talk through three particular areas. As I say, there's a whole load that we could cover um, and, and hopefully we'll get some really interesting debate questions. Um, first is around electric vehicles and the challenges associated with moving the fleet. Second is policy um, and, and the counterproductive policies that we are seeing from central government. Um, and third is around public transport and the imagery and I guess the symbolism that we have around what public transport means um, and particularly putting that in the context of the pandemic that we're, we've all been living through for the past 16, past 18 months. So if electric vehicles are to be our future, we've got a really long way to go um, by 2032, so the end of that, that carbon budget period in order to get to where we need to be in order to be on track. So at the moment, um, sales of battery electric vehicles um, amount to around 262,000. Um, so it's 262,000 of them on the UK's road network, accounting for about 6.6% .6 of new sales. We need to get that to 23.2 million vehicles on the road, making up the fleet by 2032. That's a huge ask. Um, they're starting to become price competitive. They're not there yet. Um, and, but we are moving in the right direction. 
In terms of public charging points, we currently have around 18,000 in the country. We need to get to a peer, a, a, to somewhere of around 325,000 that's recommended by the Committee on Climate Change. And again, that's really difficult to do, particularly when we start thinking about those rural communities where maybe the private the private sector doesn't have a uh, a market a market to invest in and an ability to return a profit. Um, thinking more through how we start charging these vehicles and how we start providing electricity for them, the distribution network capacity is really key here. Um, now, what we need to do is to ensure that we're, what we're doing with transport isn't prejudicing the energy networks from, become, from reaching net zero and, and decarbonizing at the same time. Um, and if we were just to shift everything, it's quite likely that the, the demand would, would outstrip the pace of zero carbon sources of energy. So we need to better link those strategies. And at the moment, that's just not coming through in central government policy. Um, and what we also need to think around, um, which I haven't actually put on the slide here, is actually how we want to build these electric vehicles. You know, they're really resource intensive. They require a lot of mining of lithium in the third world. Um, and and what, what we're going to do is place inequalities and further pressure on, on, a, on, a glo on the global south. And, and finally, just thinking through freight, Yes, we've got a good pathway for electric vehicles for cars, but in terms of in terms of vans, there's currently only six vehicles on the UK market. They're not likely to become price competitive until into the 2030s, and the demand for them is far going to outstrip supply for at least the next 10 years. So, how do we start decarbonising that area as well? And, and particularly thinking about freight, electricity is not necessarily the right power traction source. Maybe other alternative fuels such as hydrogen are more efficient for moving large large weights and volumes around. But in doing so, that needs a further set of infrastructure put in place. Um, and again, the technology is a lot further behind than cars. And, and just a further point that I think is worth dwelling on um, is that every, every sort of step that we take on this, we have to be moving quickly. Even if we manage to get to where the Committee on Climate Change thinks we need to be by 2030, um, in terms of electric vehicle sales, that's still going to require five to ten percent shift in personal mileage to bus, walking, cycling, or other active modes, in order to meet our carbon targets. And the longer that we take, so if we're slow on getting that transition to electric vehicles, or, or we get it wrong, then actually, and this was put really well by Dr. Steve Melia in the um, the UK Climate Assembly, we need to decarbonise. Um, Sorry, we, we would need to have greater reductions in travel and travel distance and impose more draconian measures. And, and that's something that I think, you know, would really start to affect people's mobility. Um, I mentioned policy. I won't dwell on it too long, um, but the national policy position is counterproductive. Um, we're sitting the government's net zero targets firm squarely against uh, policy that's been adopted for the last uh, 10 budgets where fuel duty has been frozen. Um, that's resulted in the real term cost of travel by car coming down. And that's at the same time that the rail fares, bus fares are increasing. Um, and only this year we had rail fares increasing by greater than inflation. So 2.3%. Um, that was the first time that it's increased by above inflation since 2013. And, and at the same time, the government is spending a lot of money on the roads. £3.5 billion pounds worth of funding has gone to the creation of a second tier of major road network. £27.4 billion on the roads investment strategy too. Um, and, and as we know, those are being taken to court at the moment. There's legal challenges around how the Paris Agreement uh, was not followed, how strategic environmental assessments were not undertaken in, in determining those policies. And finally, I just want to touch on public transport on a challenge before we move on to opportunities. So public transport um, before the pandemic was the clear lead in all of our carbon reduction plans, in all of the plans that we had to move people away from cars. Um, in all likelihood, they will still need to do that job because there's nothing else that can provide the volume and address those longer, the mid distance journeys. sorry, that are the um, most polluting. So those are the sort of car journeys of, of 25 miles or fewer. Um, 
But we've really had an image problem that we've been trying to address for ages. And I've got some quotes here that are actually from the Devon um, climate emergency evidence gathering phase, which really show the symbology issues that we have around public transport. Um, and there's one here that I think um, we'll, we'll, John will touch on later in terms of uh, ticketing and having integrated ticketing just being a problem. Um, but it's gotten worse, our imagery around it. And the government's official advice given during the pandemic um, was that if you cannot work from home and you need to travel, you should choose to travel by walking, cycling or driving. Um, now, there may have been very good reasons around um, why we don't want lots of people on public transport in an enclosed space. But we're starting to see the impact that that messaging, and that was a consistent messaging that we were given since May 2020, is having. Um, Pre-pandemic ridership levels of, of rail and bus um, as of June, so this is this month, are around 40 to 70% of where they were before the pandemic. On the flip side, car is actually uh, about where it was or even slightly higher. So we're starting to see that behavior change becoming embedded, which is a, a real worry. Okay, on to opportunities, because um, I'm, I'm sure I'm running out of time. I don't want to touch on all the opportunities that are commonly cited. I, thought I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that we can really do, and those are the appetite for change that exists and how we can ensure that any changes we make are people focused. So there is a clear appetite out there for change. Um, and I think this is coming through in all of the surveys that we're doing. Um, and maybe this is the result of what has happened over the past few years. We've certainly had high profile raising. Um, people like Greta Thunberg have captured the public imagination. Um, but in the UN People's Climate Vote, for instance, clean transport was the fifth most popular of all the policies that were put forward. Um, of those surveyed, the nine out of 10 countries with the most urbanized populations backed that transition to clean transport. Um, and in the UK, that was reflected in, in respondents' wishes. So 73% of, of all respondents from the UK backing a transition to, to buses, to walking and cycling and 62% backing a transition to better planning and giving more responsibility for planning to local communities. And that's a real area where we can, where we can work on and, and exploit the opportunities that we have. Um, similarly, the, the Department for Transport's National Travel Attitude Survey um, recognize, it shows a high recognition of um, the co-benefits that exist from decarbonizing our transport systems, um, particularly around health. Um, and the Department for, for Business um, has its public attitudes to track our shows that of the top four changes viewed as having the largest impact on tackling climate change, the public recognises that transport is key in that. So three of those top four are, are related to transport. Um, and again, we're seeing that starting to come through in people's purchasing power choices. So people are more willing to start purchasing electric vehicles and starting to avoid or minimize air travel. And that, that's really something that we need to seize on. Locally in Devon, just to add a bit of local mix and flavor to this, we've recently gone through the consultation on our interim carbon plan. Um, we're just about, we started last night, in fact, a citizens assembly process, but we had really great support on the carbon plan as a whole. So of all the transport related outcomes that were in there, 87% support from all respondents, 84% support for all of the actions that we have in there related to transport. And for the plan as a whole, you know, we're, we're looking at over 90% support for all or some of the actions. And that's, that's a really great place for us to be in because it allows us to start driving change. Okay, last, last couple of slides before I, I hand over. Um, I mentioned about making things people focused and that I think this is a real area where we've got a great opportunity to grasp and take things forward and, and get buy-in. And that's really what we need. We need buy-in. Um, better developments is key. Um, as a profession, we've been striving for years to have better spatial planning and transport planning. Generally, these are undertaken in silos. They're not necessarily as well linked as they should be. Um, but by building better developments, ensuring that we're building developments that are mixed use, have modal filters, we're building them in urban areas where we can exploit public transport opportunities. We can really go a long way to ensuring that we are building in carbon neutral developments at the start, making sure that they're designed around public transport and active modes. 
Also, we get the opportunity to relocalize our services, and this works across the piece. It works in our rural communities and it works in our urban communities. So if we can reduce the need to travel, we allow people to work from home, we allow people to um, telecommute, to, to access other services such as patient services through, through digital means, then we can start to give people more time in their local communities. That allows us to start bringing facilities and services back relocalizing those services and, and getting a resurgence of social social and cultural activities that will really help to spur local communities together. This then will hopefully lead on to being able to develop place-based shared visions, um, getting the community more involved in, in planning decisions. Um, and, and many of you will have seen the, the, what's been mentioned as the 15 minute city as well. So this is making sure that um, everything is accessible within 15 minutes that people don't need to, to drive in order to get to the facilities that they need. Um, and, and really the relocalization element of that is exploiting what we already have. Um, for example, in Devon, many of our communities are already 15 minute communities, but maybe they just don't have quite the amount of services that we need in order to, in order to make sure that we're reducing transport as much as possible. There's also a real opportunity to level up um, and ensure that we have an equitable and just transport system. Um, so there's various statistics out there in terms of who pollutes, but um, in terms of the, the key ones here, international flights, 70% of those are taken by just 15% of people. Um, transport spending in the UK, only 16% of that is focused on local public transport um, compared to the rest, which is, is, is largely focused on the road network. Um, and, and really, we start seeing that drawing through in terms of who start, who is using these facilities. So we see that local in, uh, low income and deprived communities are more likely to use public transport and they're having less money spent on them. So there's a real opportunity here to start leveling up and ensuring that we're making this equitable transition. And in terms of the benefits of decarbonizing our transport system, um, you know, again, deprived communities, low income communities are more often than not associated with high levels of air pollution. And what we can start to do is redress that balance. And we can see that on the economic side as well. So the average benefit cost ratio, so that's how much money we put in to develop a scheme versus how much we get back, is around 13 to 1 for walking and cycling schemes. So every one pound we spend, we get 13 pounds back to the economy. Um, highway schemes, on the other hand, are much more expensive. As I say, we've already noted the the government's risk scheme, which is 27.4 billion pounds worth of funding over the next five years. And, and generally it's considered a good result in that if you get a, a BCR of two to one. So for every one pound you put in, you get two pounds back for the economy. Um, and many of the schemes are much lower than that. So we can really start to use public, public funds in better ways. And, and finally, last slide, um, again, on this equitable and just transition, we're in a position where decades of planning policy have led to us dedicating around 20% of all urban space to car use. Um, is that a good use of our public space? Can we start to redress that balance by moving people away from cars and into more sustainable modes? And likewise, you know, cars are associated in the UK with around five deaths per day. Around 58% of those are for vulnerable road users, i.e. those people who aren't in cars, so pedestrians and cyclists. Um, motorcyclists are another, another feature in that 58%. But around 26% of all road deaths are due to pedestrians. So we really have an opportunity here to start redressing the balance, bringing down these accident and incident rates. Um, and of course, there's co-benefits again associated with that. So reducing health complications, um, there's a real, there's, there's a lot of evidence out there suggesting that there's this huge multiplier effect of active travel. So once you get people walking and cycling, um, that then brings further benefits in terms of their health, uh, reducing the dependency that they have on the health service and the need to access health facilities. Um, and some estimates have shown that that could be a, a 17 billion pound in, uh, worth of uh, improvements in terms of the National Health Services budget. So, so it's really critical. And if we capitalize on that, it really shows the benefit that we can give to society. At that point, I, I wanna pause, um, let you have a think about some of those points um, and just say thank you for listening. Um, as I say, it's very much a, 
an introduction there, um, maybe trying to focus on some more of the opportunities and challenges that aren't always banded about. Um, and yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what discussions come out from that. So, so with that, I'll, I'll pass back to Andrew. So thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you very much indeed for a really good start to the session. And we're getting a huge amount of really good questions coming through as well. So excellent start. Now, our second presentation is from Professor John Shaw. Now, I know many of you will be familiar with John's work already. He's been a, a senior contributor to academic research on transport and mobilities now, not just within the UK, but globally for uh, well over two decades. He's the author of several acclaimed uh, books on sustainable transport and a recognised uh, expert on uh, UK uh, rail. Now, in addition to all of that, you wonder where he gets the time, uh, but he is also the head of geography, earth and environmental science here at Plymouth University. Now, John is presenting this morning on reducing transport carbon through smart ticketing. So welcome, John, uh, and I will hand over to you. Thanks in, very much indeed, Andrew. And uh, I don't know about all those nice things you said about uh, reputation, but I do know that it's been two decades because I can see myself in the screen <laughs> at the moment and uh, so we're looking at the ravages of time directly. Um, thanks very much indeed for that kind introduction, Andrew. Uh, and thanks, Nick, for that, that really fantastic overview of where we are uh, at the moment. And what I'd like to do really is just focus in on, on one a uh, small example of how we try and get things done to move uh, the agenda along, to, to promote modal shift in the context of the need to decarbonize, etc., um, in the context of British uh, governance and public policy. And uh, the, in order to do this, I'm going to tell you a, a story about um, the work that Andrew himself, actually, and I have been doing, but largely, Andrew, it has to be said, um, over the last uh, ooh, God, 15 years or so, I suppose, in relation to uh, smart ticketing. Now, smart ticketing, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what it is, uh, is difficult in the UK, um, or at least in Great Britain, outside of London, because of, you've heard a lot of it in Nick's presentation, government policy. And government policy and transport isn't particularly conducive to promoting uh, modal shift, sustainable uh, 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 ways of moving, decarbonisation, etc. That's because generally the government tends not to like to lead. It thinks the market can do uh, most things better than the government and takes a, takes a, a, a background role and pr promotes all of these extraordinarily complex quasi markets like in the railway industry uh, and in the bus industry. Generally, what we tend to see is while there are pockets of excellence in the, the bus rail industry, I mean, absolutely there are uh, really th things that we can be proud of. At the general level, uh, the policy levers just really aren't there to promote uh, that, that level of modal shift that we need. So a long time ago, um, Andrew and I knew each other when Andrew was the uh, chairman of uh, the um, Devon and Cornwall Rail Partnership, not the chairman, the, the, the officer of the Devon and Cornwall Rail Partnership. That was here in Plymouth, and that was back in the late 90s. And then I went to Aberdeen. Uh, Andrew actually went to Aberdeen as well, briefly, in the sense that he was in first group. Um, uh, Andrew went off to have a career in local government and, and industry uh, and ended up back in regional government. Um, I w used, worked at the University of Aberdeen and uh, then came back to Plymouth some time later. And parallel, in parallel with each other, we, the, the work we'd done both was really pointing to um, a, a particular problem that we have outside of London in Great Britain. Uh, the bus industry is largely market driven. Um, in London, Transport for London can plan its network, set its fares, um, determine all of the conditions of service. Um, whereas elsewhere in Great Britain, that's not the case, that local authorities can do that, and uh, bus companies decide where they want to run, uh, when they want to run there, what tickets they put in place, uh, and so on. And that was problematic if you want to get to a situation where you are in London at the moment, where it was an Oyster card, well, I suppose it still is for some people, but otherwise it's just your bank card or whatever, you, where you can tap into a, to a bus, any bus, any time, um, and you're charged up to a particular maximum cap on any given day uh, and then that's it. Now that's dead simple 
for the passenger to conceive of, dead simple for the passenger to use. Don't have to worry about whether the bus is blue or red or white or green. You don't have to worry about how much it's going to cost you on any individual journey because you know that you'll never pay more than a certain maximum any given day. Dead easy. If we want to bring people onto public transport, make it nice, make it easy. To use the words of my colleagues in UWE, uh, Juliet, Jane and Billy Clayton, Billy Clayton, make it an ideal bus journey. One that's nice alternative to a car and one that you actually want to use. So that was the, the idea, the vision that we, that Andrew and I had, uh, had um, um, settled on really as part of our broader work, that, that smart ticketing was going to be a really, really important way of attracting people, or part of the armory of attracting people to use the bus. So I did my work in academia, now, Andrew's included in some of this. He's got a magnificent chapter on, on smart uh, mobility in that, that yellow and white book on the, on the end there. Um, and Andrew did his work in, in government. And then uh, fate brought us back together again in the mid-2000s, where we were able to um, concentrate in, on bringing together our academic and our practitioner and governance experience into um, the, uh, the smart ticketing arena. Now, in order to uh, promote or to, ena to enable uh, smart ticketing uh, outside of London, it's very, very complicated. And there's a, an, an institution called ITSO, which basically comes up with a mechanism whereby different bus companies can uh, refer to this, this kind of broker system so that if people use a, 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 a smart uh, card on one of their services, that gets logged and revenue gets apportioned appropriately. I've got the example there of the concessionary fares card. That, that's the English version. Obviously, there's one in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. Um, and that was really the big kind of rollout uh, 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 platform or program rather for, for it. So, so that every time people who have one of those cards get on a bus and tap it on the machine, uh, then that information gets logged and then the, the, uh, the revenue is apportioned through to the operators accordingly. So this was kind of the, um, the, the, the platform that had to be put in place and had to be road tested first that, um, uh, it, that, that could be used then in order to, uh, to roll out smart ticketing across the bus industry outside of um, London. Now, of course, there's a slight problem here because we're just assuming that all the bus companies would want to do it. I mean, you'd think that anything that made public transport easier and therefore had the opportunity to increase the market, increase the market share, bus travel outside of London has been declining in Britain for years, um, would be universally welcomed. But no, ladies and gentlemen, some of the, uh, the big uh, bus operators are surprisingly territorial and surprisingly um, not up for the idea of uh, what we might call inter-operator ticketing, in other words, one ticket that can you, you can use on any bus, and it's difficult for local authorities, or it has been difficult for local authorities to persuade them to get them to do it, although there has been success now. So we have like the skipper, for example, in Plymouth, where it costs you more, but you can use it on uh, the different city bus companies. So um, Andrew, uh, with uh, funding that he secured from the Department for Transport, um, so set up smart, Southwest Smart Applications, Limited. And in the map here, down in, the, in our familiar part of the world in the southwest of England, in the dark orange, um, um, those local authorities uh, were brought together and uh, were able to work together in order to try and promote the idea of smart or uh, interoperable uh, ticketing. Now, that proved to be popular and it's proved to be uh, something that has been upscalable across the uh, whole of GB. And, and you can see there in the map that uh, uh, the, the, the coverage across England, Scotland and Wales now in terms of member local authorities is quite significant. And um, the, indeed, the name has had to be changed. So it's now no longer rooted in the southwest, but indeed it's Smart Applications Management uh, is the name of the company, which now acts as this kind of broker uh, in order to allow local authorities and bus companies to work together to promote smart and interoperable ticketing in their regions. So what are the benefits then? The, the rather grandiosely uh, at the title at the title of the slide, it said that uh, working together to, uh, to reduce uh, carbon um, through smart ticketing. Let me give you first of all an idea of the scale of SAM's operations. So you can see um, in, in the, the last, uh, well, the calendar year 
uh, sorry, the, <laughs> the, the operational year, financial year uh, previous to, to this one, um, the number of transactions which are supported by uh, SAM uh, across the country. So a very significant number, 116 um, million transactions which are made up of some commercial transactions, so that's people like me uh, getting on the bus and, and tapping my uh, bank card on, or but predominantly concessionary and scholar transactions, so that's the, the, the use of those cards that I suggested earlier on. Um, and that the average single fare of £2.33, you can see it's a very significant amount of um, bus business that, uh, that, that, that Sam's smart uh, card work is, is underpinning. Two hundred and seventy-two uh, million pounds. Now, as a result of that, we can save pollutants. And you might think, well, how do we do that? Okay, well, at least historically, over the last ten or fifteen years or so, while we've been doing this work, um, bus engines have been diesel, Euro four, Euro five, Euro six, etc. And more recently, of course, there are hybrid buses. There are buses that whose engines turn off when you um, when when they come to a stop. There are uh, electric buses and so on. But what smart ticketing does is it reduces the, the, the amount of time it takes to board each passenger. Rather than people fumbling around for change or whatever, it's just tap straight in and away you go. And um, the Department for Transport validated uh, a model which, can, which, which worked out how much time on average uh, buses will save. And it's uh, uh, you, about two seconds per passenger. Uh, and then if you multiply that time saved up across the whole of the, the, the network for bus companies' fleets, you can work out that actually the route now takes less time to do. There's less time idling uh, at bus stops. And as a result of that, you can speed up your, your schedules and have uh, more idle time at the end of, um, more time, engine off time at the end of routes or have fewer buses or whatever. So if you use um, DEFRA published um, values for tons of carbon NOx and pm 10 emitted into the, into the atmosphere, you can calculate roughly the uh, financial value of um, carbon uh, NOx and PM10s, which are reduced as a result of using smart ticketing directly. And also, obviously, there's not just a financial value to that, but a, a, an environmental one as well. So the figures on the top are for England, and then uh, Wales and Scotland uh, on the bottom. There's also a, um, a, a, another for kind of financial sustainability value, and that is to do with what we call hot listing of stolen cards. So on the average, each um, smart card has an annual transaction value, value of about 320 pounds. In other words, people make about 320 pounds worth of journeys per card per year. Um, but when cards get stolen, then people might just uh, use the people who have stolen the cards will continue to use them until they have been reported as stolen and then deleted from or stopped in the system. And as a result of Sam's work, you can do that very quickly. Um, and so you can, you can really uh, push down on the amount of money which is wasted uh, through paying for uh, bus journeys through stolen tickets. And um, uh, in that period, that three-year period you can see there, um, Sam was able to stop 30,000 um, uh, stolen cards. And that has uh, a value uh, very significantly uh, uh, helping local authorities um, from spending money that they, they really don't have to. In the future, what can you do with Sam? How can we uh, capitalize on this trend at the moment where younger people are seeming to use cars less and uh, um, have um, driving uh, licenses at an older age and see that cohort effect move through? Um, how can we get people to use the bus um, and be enthusiastic about using the bus uh, once they don't quote unquote have to to go to school. Well, how about rolling out a national young person's bus card and acknowledging that National Rail's um, uh, artwork and um, ideas here in terms of the young person's rail card. Now that's great in it so because uh, you can issue young people with a card and they're able to use it on, on the buses. Um, unfortunately, the latest bus white paper um, and uh, promotions document, which is headlines, all bells and whistles, an extra three billion pounds for buses in, um, in the country. Absolutely fantastic. But um, for some reason, the government is being rather coy about ITSO and playing down the role of ITSO. And it wants to move much more to a kind of London system whereby people tap in, tap off with um, their 
uh, credit cards or whatever. And that's, uh, that's quite difficult um, if you've got uh, an eight-year-old kid or a 10-year-old kid. So there's going to have to be some kind of, um, uh, of card, you would think, or, uh, or whatever to, to promote that. But there we are, ladies and gentlemen, just a, a quick story of um, what we've been doing in, uh, in, at the University of Plymouth in um, association with Sam and um, very much uh, that, uh, the work of, um, of uh, Andrew and uh, supported by the university. Thanks very much. John, that's great. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Uh, now, we have got a uh, left over for questions, and indeed, thank you everybody who sent them through. Um, because we've only got a few minutes, I'm going to go straight in and cherry pick um, a few of them. The first is the one uh, originally sent in by Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. And it uh, comes back to uh, EVs and effectively um, road uh, pricing uh, and charging. So Caroline was asking, as a driver of an EV, I would argue that a charging network on our motorways and A roads is long overdue and needs to be ramped up in scale and that this is more important than town centre charging. So, of course, linking dominant use and high commuter type uh, use to a fairer cost versus uh, damage undertaken. Uh, Nick, is this something that you've looked at uh, so far in terms of how greater road user charging might be uh, rolled out? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, that one. I think um, in terms of Caroline's question, I wasn't quite sure if she was asking in terms of charging for physically charging your vehicle or charging in terms of a, a driver cost that they would pay in order to use the network. But um, I guess if we tackle it from both both elements, um, so on the charging side of things, actually, you know, plugging your vehicle in to charge it, you would go and fill up fuel. Um, probably the interurban network and the motorway network is where the Committee for Climate Change is showing that the government has actually made some progress and is on to make reasonable progress um, throughout the next carbon budget period in order to better serve, serve road users. So there is a plan there. And I think that's something that um, the Committee on Climate Change recognises the government's actually doing reasonably well in. It's all those other town centre areas that are are less well thought through and you know maybe we don't have the linkage between regional policy and how regional EV strategies will be taken forward with what the national requirements are. In terms of a road user charging element if we're talking about that element I think that's a really interesting question. Um, every time that's proposed it, it obviously conjures up quite a lot of opposition. People don't want to pay uh, at source or be seen to be paying at source um, but the government is probably going to have to very seriously consider this. Um, just thinking through the cost of fuel um, and, and where your money goes, I think it's around 55 pence of every every litre that you fill up of petrol at the moment goes to the government through fuel duty. Now, as I mentioned, that's been frozen since for the past 10 years, um, but it's still a, a decent sized uh, source of revenue for the government. As we transition to EVs, um, the government essentially will, will start getting less fuel duties in and we'll start seeing that it's it's, money to the treasury declining so it's going to need an alternative source in order to, to bring that in and road user charging is is potentially a good way of doing that um yeah. what that would take in terms of the form um you know would people be charged based on the carbon intensity of their vehicle would they be charged on the time of day that they travel as in are they commute are they contributing more to congestion um, is there a maintenance charge associated with that with the roads and, and does it this replace vehicle exercise duty altogether? Very interesting question. But yeah, I certainly think it, it needs a lot of looking into, but probably needs to be done very quickly. Otherwise, Treasury is going to recognise it has a huge hole in its finances. Yeah. Nick, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. We have run over on the session. Um, can I please ask for those of you who did very generously add in some comments, to please put them in the comments section of our transport and mobility discussion board and i'll try and do a screen grab of all of them as well uh, and add them there as well we had some great questions coming in not just on the um, production of the energy for electric vehicles uh, and road pricing but also about town planning and the role of planners and also the hypocrisy and the way that mps themselves have been lobbying to remove sustainable measures that were put in during the pandemic Thank you, everybody, for your engagement and very much thank you to the two speakers. 
this morning for this session and also for the university back office team for making sure that it all uh, worked on the new uh, platform. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of, uh, of the day.